uh, studies are actually conducted by my students. My students, when they come to NUS, uh, urbanize uh, students can be quite so cool, but uh, after doing a research project, uh, it's quite amazing what they're able to find out. Uh, right? uh, and uh, when I started, um, there was an author researcher who talked to Peter Ng, the crab expert, and he said, uh, we don't know what authors are doing actually. If you find a foolish student, then uh, get them to uh, join in. So I joined in. Uh, but what I realized is there were many, many species. Uh, there were like 80 names of authors, but actually it's just four species, right? And uh, in Asia, and of the four, uh, two had been reported from Singapore, but um, Bern uh, Bernard Harrison's father, John Harrison, mentioned authors in 66, but then after that, we don't really have records. So, so they're missing like 70s, 80s, um, and a good reason too, la, there was a lot of uh, urbanization. So if you're an author trying to hang out in the coast, it's quite a depressing period because there's reclamation. Uh, reservoirs were being built, right? So rivers were being canalized. Um, <clears throat> but fast forward to happier times, right? Uh, the reclamation activity is considerable, but it has calmed down. Uh, there's a network of parks and park connectors. Uh, the reservoirs, although they are all not natural, right? They're all canals and uh, vertical wall bodies of water. They are clean, right? Uh, and they're full of fish. So this is uh, Kalang River from the 60s. I was in St. Andrew School and the nearby Potong Pase residents called the Kalang River, um, the dead chicken river. Yeah. So uh, it was black and stinky and nothing lived, right? Uh, occasionally, if you're lucky and there's heavy storms, then there were pig carcasses floating down. Uh, now, this, this is my school uh, and it's clean and auto swim in it. Uh, but canalized rivers were important for flood control. Uh, and um, only recently was a canal naturalized. So modern engineers say, okay, we can naturalize the canal. It still will allow us to manage flood. So Bishan Amokyo is like a dream, you know. It's the only park, I think, uh, and parks gets unsolicited compliments about this park, right? Um, and there's a guy living uh, next to the park and he's taking videos of otters hunting fish uh, every other day. Um, but what were in the canals is a lot of exotic fish. Uh, so these are photos of fishermen from the internet and they're catching lots of big fish. So we had a dinner table that was getting stacked with food. Uh, just waiting for a large predator to turn up and it was an otter, right? It actually turned up in uh, 1998. So uh, this is Singapore and next door is Malaysia, right? It's our source of many things that disappeared, right? So uh, two different countries, but it's just a river. So they turned out in Sungai Buloh. We predicted that, we expected that they would turn out in Sungai Buloh in 1994. And four years later, they were resident. So uh, they were there with pups, right? And uh, we saw them around woodlands. And then there were reports on Tekong and Ubin. This includes small claw otters as well. Uh, and then eventually, we started seeing them in Changi, uh, Lorong Halus, Pulau Serangoon. Uh, all this is due to records submitted by members of public, right? Uh, and so these kind of photos were like, wow, so uh, precious, right? Because remember, I've been working in the early 90s in Malaysia and Indonesia, and I would walk at night upwind without a torch because the otters were so shy, right? But here they're turning up, they were visible. Uh, we were very happy when they had juveniles, right? Uh, then this is golf courses, they started uh, appearing. Uh, and as they spread, eventually they reached Bishan Park. Now. Of course, the, the, during this time, many people in the submit records, they asked us, hey, there are seals. I saw seals in Singapore. Oh, I saw beavers. This, this especially in the early days, uh, later on, people began to realize, oh, these are authors. And um, um, the Minister of uh, National Development, Kobun Wan, he was so excited because um, the authors turned up in um, Gardens by the Bay. Right? So all the Gardens by the Bay staff were exchanging on their WhatsApp. I seen an author here, I seen an author there. I went down to investigate with Adrian Lu, who's now at Park, And we hunted, hunted, and we figured out, okay, I think we know there's an author in the gardens. And then, uh, this was after about four hours of work. And then, lo and behold, the author walked out of the reservoir, walked across my feet. So, you know, 
I'm the guy who's been stalking otters from a distance. This otter walked up, he looked at me briefly, and then he carried on walking. We we're like, oh, this is madness. And then he went to the children's garden, and then he stood on his hind legs, and he vocalized. So we said, no, not one otter, there must be two. But we hadn't seen the female, right? That means the female is expecting. And then later on that evening, uh, gardens visitors sent uh, Gardens by the Bay video footage. The mum was there, right? And then eventually they had birth to cubs. Uh, and then, you know, <coughs> Kobun Wan wanted to announce it and, and we had to figure out, okay, what message should he give? Uh, uh, besides saying otters are here, and we came up with watch from a distance, right? Enjoy the view of otters from a distance. Uh, and then when it turned out at Bishan Park, Bishan Park just adopted it, right? So that was good because um, nature deficit Singaporeans turned out they were had quite, uh, they're quite sensible with otters. Uh, mostly they kept the distance. Sometimes some people went down to approach and then other people say, oh, don't go so close. So that was good, right? Um, and of course, it made for wonderful photos like, against the landscape. And then, you know, there were Facebook groups with tens of thousands of visitors and, you know, people around the world were following it. Uh, I, I, I've, I had a lot of pain in my heart for my fellow author researchers who were still trudging through the night trying to find an author and we were getting photos like this. So um, when they visit, it's like therapy. They sit down and they watch the authors close. The author watchers in Singapore have taken so many global visitors out, researchers, uh, and it's like therapy for their soul. Can you imagine we have an Australian, uh, one of our Australian senior scientists has been working on authors 30 years, hasn't seen them in the wild in Europe. So they appeared in many places. This is Meryl's uh, um, slides from her thesis. And you can see they started occupying every like possible space. And then February 2014, also oh, important, appear at Marina Bay. And then after that, went into uh, Bishan Amokyo. So SG50, uh, Australia gave us 50 barbecues, one of which was at Bishan. Uh, our Prime Minister was with Abbott, the Australian PM. And then the authors turned up and played and they watched, uh, they came down and they took photos and we have it on video. A wonderful ambassador, right? Then of course, people ask, how many authors are? Uh? Then uh, we asked for a lot of records. So this was Merrill's project. Uh, uh, Merrill's project started asking people for records. And then eventually Max did a phenomenal job of hunting down right, every family, right? Uh, make sure we weren't double counting, uh, photo, video verification, all that. And then we came up with a number. La. So roughly we think uh, 10 plus families, uh, maybe around 90 individuals. Uh, it's a, it seems to be about maxed out already the space. La. They don't seem to like reservoirs, maybe hard to catch fish. Uh, they really like the, the rivers, the coast, right? And then we put out this graphic so that people realize we actually do have uh, Asian small claw otter in Pulau Ubin. So MPAX is very concerned about that. They require the smaller streams in mangrove to catch small fish and prawns and all that and fiddler crab. So mangrove restoration work at Pulau Ubin is a very, very important project because the small claw otter clings on precariously to that corner of the island. And this is a reflection of Asia. As Asian cities clean up rivers, the smooth kota otter will return. It can handle the big rivers and the big fish in those rivers. So they have a survival in the future by coexisting with men in cleaned up urban environments. But the small claw otter still needs the natural habitat. So in Malaysia, they are confident about your small claw otter. In fact, it turned up in Klang River near KL. But uh, small claw otter, we think habitat is uh, declining. So uh, that's the situation. It's a reflection of the situation in Asia. So this is Singapore, you know, in a nutshell. It's like a petri dish. It's like a lab for the rest of Asia. So we are quite, um, uh, we are quite aware of this responsibility. The things we find out, we try and make sure we share. La. So when students do the projects and then we write out the papers, that's our Singapore's contribution to helping out uh, auto conservation in Asia. Right? Now, one of the problems is danger in crossing roads. So this was video taken by a PUV guy, uh, coastal road, right? And uh, there's a lot of heavy vehicles steaming down those roads. So as otters move between one patch of habitat to another, uh, they got to navigate and they're not always lucky. La. So, you know, then you get roadkill. We try to recover the carcasses. Nowadays, uh, we'll send it to Chiada, the pathologist at Singapore Zoo. Uh, to do autopsy. Uh, if it's not just a straightforward roadkill, we want to know what's happening. Uh. So recovering of the carcass and all that, the whole 
uh, of the working group community uh, sees to uh, sees to it. Uh, so, uh, what have the students' projects uh, revealed, right? right? So, one of the things is, um, otters during my time were nocturnal animals, right? But here, they are diurnal. That means they are active in the day. So, typically, they have two peak activities. Lah. So, if you ask an otter watcher, undergone sea otters, when to find, they will tell you early morning or uh, late afternoon. Right, this is typical for many diner animals. Uh, uh, nobody is so crazy to go out in the midday sun. So they make sure they get their food beginning of the day and then they have a supplemental meal towards the end of the day. If you see an animal hunting like middle of the day, then <clears throat> it didn't get enough food during the morning hunt. Right, so active two to three times a day, dawn to dusk, and of course they engage in a variety of activity. Um, uh, this kind of scene was fascinating for people around the world because they've come from uh, <clears throat> a little crevice near a substation and then they come out to the side canal that will lead to the Singapore River uh, and they have to make this big leap, right? So uh, there was a bunch of people leaning on the railing with me and watching them as they made their way out to go for breakfast, right? Uh, and this is at Bishan Amokyo, so HTB Heartland, they can see otters moving in formation uh, and how they are uh, making contact calls uh, as they hunt. This was at McRitchie and this was handphone video, you know, so they were next to me, uh, ignoring me and they were hunting and of course uh, hammering the uh, park's vegetation, but you know, it's at park, so it's okay. So, uh, <clears throat> we've studied some of this, uh, we've shared it in lectures, and in papers uh, and video footage. But the first people to share were actually otter watchers on the ground, uh, taking a lot of videos. So if you look up Fast Nail on YouTube, right? Uh, he's actually labeled a video like what's going on. Is it, is it sprinting? Is it hunting and all that? So there's wonderful video tutorials for people around the world. When I started looking for otters, I went to Zoo Nagara, which had smooth coated otters. And I went to the enclosure every day for four days in order to be clear in my mind what the smooth otter looked like, right? Uh, Singapore Zoo had small claw otter, so I went to look for smooth coat otter. Now the amount of video material is phenomenal, right? Um, okay, interesting thing. We got all these fish in the canals, right? Should you eat fish head first, body first, or tail first? So we will go for the body, right? That's where all the soft flesh is. But uh, these otters are going head first, right? And when they slice through the head, my goodness, it's effortless, right? So this is an otter eating the head, right? So I realized, oh, we got to look at it from their perspective. They have carnations. It's a phenomenal uh, scissor cutting teeth. And so the head of a fish is not an issue. We also think it might be easier for handling. So you have a strong grasp on the fish, bite off the head, and it's no longer struggling. But when it comes to catfish, Wow, that one is a different kettle of fish, right? So catfish, they eat the tail first. Because I don't know if you've seen a, a, a fisherman trying to beat a catfish into submission. That's a pretty tough skull. Right? Um, oh, and then we see begging behavior. So adults, at some stage of their life, must become, uh, yes, unimpressed by the whining of their young, it's time for you to go up and uh, go look for food, right? Um, okay, sorry. It, do they need dry land? Yes, they need to dry off. In fact, um, uh, Nicole Duple, when she was uh, uh, just finished her field work, she studied zoos around the world. She realized some zoos didn't even give otters dry land. They couldn't dry up and they would suffer from hypothermia and die in shock and all that kind of stuff. So it's very important that they dry their fur, right? Uh, because as it gets waterlogged, then it's no longer insulating. Now, in an urban environment, they are adaptable. They make use of soil beneath uh, urban structures. Oh, and they love that MPAX has so many mulching at the base of trees. Now, this is sprinting. They're going to toilet. It's mainly fish particles that come out. Uh, but they also have this wonderful smell. It's pheromones. And these uh, serve as advertisement. So, you know, when I was sorting through fish scales uh, from Penang and trying to figure out what on earth was going on, 
uh, Indian postgrad walked past and he identified parts and then I realized he was a fish biologist. They have to boil a fish down and reassemble it by uh, sticking all the bones together. So he was an expert. So really this work should be done by fish biologists. Uh, so Meryl, who looked through Spain's uh, sprains, uh, we took our hat off to her because she could identify fish from parts with the help of our fish experts in the museum, right? So they eat all these fish, right? Uh, in mangroves, they eat quite a bit of prawns too, right? Uh, and then after they finish feeding, they go back to a hope. Now, it's quite funny because in the past, when we studied them in the wild, we'll have all kinds of measurements about substrate for the hope and all that. Uh, in the urban environment, they just want to squeeze a place to squeeze in so that a predator or competitor that's attacking them will find it very difficult to approach them. And, you know, they upturned everything about how big should a family be, first litter, second litter, third litter, fourth, fifth. My God, the numbers increase. We've got up to 19. Um, so why are they so large? Uh, maybe there's a lot of food. Maybe it's hard to find new territory, so they, they might be staying together. Um, and how far do they travel? So, you know, uh, they were in gardens by the bay, right? Uh, same families have gone all the way up Kalang River to Bishan Amukyo, go to the reservoir, right? Uh, and they've actually looped around and come back down Singapore River. So uh, that's quite, this whole area, you think, oh, how many otters could we have? Could we have 100 otters here? Right now, we think the most four families. Right, so there's not a lot of space because you need to hunt, then fish get scared, then you got to shift your location, right? Uh, so a common question is, uh, will otters, will there be so many otters that they'll come and uh, snatch our children? And uh, the tragedy of that is actually there's a concept called carrying capacity. Everything is limited by space, right? So even Singapore, right, we don't build enough flats, then uh, we're not going to have new families. So they will fight, right? And when they fight, then uh, pups get killed. Uh, they get killed by roadkill. So about, we lose about 10% of the population now. Thankfully for otters, they are so charming. I mean, I'm so jealous because uh, I'm involved in long-tail macaque work and long-tail macaques, like, everyone's like, oh, bad monkey, but otter is good otter. So uh, they have a disproportionately high charm potential. Uh, but we've had to explain. So this Tian Chao from M Parks, every time there's an area where otters are interfacing in public, they don't go out and put up signs. Uh, very basic explanations. Watch from a distance, essentially, is it. Right? And people follow uh, Otter Watch and Otter City. Uh, we also took a deliberate intent to educate our leadership. Lah. So we joined with PA, right? uh, their project Blue Wave. Uh, we put a young person like Max to go and talk to our minister, explain concepts like carrying capacity, so it's been encouraging, right? And PA, well, when we partner them, then they went nuts, man. There's a guy who walks around in the otter suit. It's like, you know scientist is going to do that. We won't even think of it. So we have to have partners from a diverse group, right? So this is Otter Working Group. You can see Ambu on the far right. Uh, she's on Acres. Um, on the left was Merrill, and then there was Tian Chao for M Parks, uh, even uh, from M Parks, and there are people from PUB. And of course, the minister wants to know what's going on. So... I'm going to stop here. I've given you enough uh, food for thought, right? So, okay, ask me questions now. All right. Thank you for that, Siva. That was very entertaining. Of course, with all of the outer pictures. So, um, I don't know whether you saw the chat, but it's like exploding. We've got a bunch of questions. Oh, that's good. Right. Um, so, uh, if anyone, uh, how do you want to do this? Do you want me to highlight them or do you just want to read the questions to you? Um, why do otters not shit in the water? And why do they do in the passageway or footpath? So you, you can help highlight for me, uh, Kanan. So okay. why do they not defecate in the water? Well, uh, defecation serves that uh, function of advertisement. So a lone otter that turns up, smells the area. Hey, there, there's a female chick here. Let me, sorry, not chick, uh, otter. Uh, let me go and check out. Or if another male comes, it's a holy cow, there's a, territorial meal here and then I, I want to be cautious. So there's an advertisement purpose. And so if it's an advertisement, you don't uh, bury it somewhere in the woods, right? You do it in a prominent place. Okay, fair enough. Um, Why don't I we mean, see small claw otters inland? Uh, they can't handle our big canals. Huh? So they really need small mangrove streams. Oh, I see. Then there's uh, Marcus counting me down privately. <laughs> 
Uh, Ing Sin has asked, uh, in addition to the question above about the small cloth otters inland, uh, could uh, inland populations of freshwater crabs support populations of uh, small cloth otters? So our freshwater streams, right, in our central catchment are very precious. That's why when people talk about digging inside the central catchment, we go nuts. Huh? Uh, and there's very few streams and there are not many crabs. If you're out in one of those streams doing a crab survey, um, the common crab he talks about, it seems to be a lot, but that lot is not enough to support uh, any otter population. Okay. Uh, Gwyn wants to know if, uh, if there's any evidence that small cloth otters might get pushed around by the smooth cloth otters. Um, since their diet is uh, quite different, you know, small fiddler crab, small fish, uh, and then the, the smooth cloth otter, larger, right, fish, uh, they, they seem to be able to coexist. So along Malaysian coast, there is coexistence of smooth coated and small cloth. But there may be some spatial uh, separation. So sometimes we don't know whether the small cloth otter is coming out at night, uh, if the smooth coated otter is there in the day. Uh, there haven't been really a lot of studies about that. Um, but I would expect a bigger otter to pick all the best hope sites. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, let's see, the next question. Uh, Ching Yi wants to know if both these uh, otter species can coexist. Coexist? Uh? Uh, yeah, so I kind of answered that, right? They, they do coexist because your, your wetland environment is uh, quite complex. It's not uniform. So for example, Malaysia, right? There's paddy fields. Then there's mangroves, right? Uh, uh, rocky shore. Uh, so different, uh, the different species do better in slightly different situations. So you could find them within the same large area, but there are habitat variations that would support uh, both species. So um, when, when I was working in Malaysia or Indonesia, they would occur uh, together. You'd find both of them together. Okay. Um, next, we have... Uh... Steve wants to know if uh, solo otters appearing in our rivers are expelled from a family, or is this their natural progression of them heading out and expanding their territories? So um, um, the otters, like any mammals, when uh, they achieve, when the males achieve sexual maturity, they will they will wander off, right, uh, with that rising testosterone. So actually, what's curious is we don't see as many uh, uh, sub adults wandering off as we would expect. A lot of them stay in the family. So um, there's more research on birds about this, like cooperative breeding, you know. That means the, the first litter will stay with the parent and then help in the rearing of the second litter. So your, your elder brother, elder sister. But okay. the, the primary care when the mother feeds the fish to the young is normally done by the parent. Um, so what uh, some of my students research, Tina um, and Anusha, uh, we realized that, and from the author watchers, right, the territory shrinks when they're raising uh, pups. So when the territory shrinks, they all hang around the pups, you know. So uh, if you're a carnivore going and hunting fish, the fish will now be terrified and they start moving about. So your effort to get the fish is going to keep increasing. But yet they stay with the pups for weeks. So actually they are providing protection from the pups at the expense of their dinner. Right? So that's why, you know, when the pups oh, can swim already, then the adults are always like, come on, come on, follow me. And then the pup, oh, I cannot swim anymore and all that. Uh, it was very, very easy to realize this at Singapore River because uh, we had a hole and then you had a long river and you could see how far the pup would follow the adult before they swim, swim, swim and then turn back. And then, you know, there are bridges along Singapore River. So you could see gradually they managed to make it to Marina Bay. And then they can go and hunt in fresh areas where the fish are not as molested so regularly. So this is um, uh, foraging patches. So every carnivore and every territorial animal uh, will have to establish a large home range and then sample the, the food from different parts. Right? They can't eat, keep eating in one part and they run out of food. So they have to move between patches. And so then they become territorial and then if they see someone else turn up, then like get out of my place. So we see that happening with community cats. Uh, some of them are quite territorial, so new guy comes and they go and beat them up. And why? Because they protect uh, feeding ground. Okay. Um, 
or someone's asking about the Little India sighting. So this uh, otters in Little India, right? Uh, were there any other otters sighted around, um, like in, in urban areas during this circuit breaker period? And uh, were there any other animals that you know of? Oh, okay. So the, 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 the Little India otters is uh, like a tragic family, you know, it's like... Um, they reared, they couldn't find a place to rear their pups, so they finally went to Botanic Gardens. So last year, October, the otter watchers said, hey, hey, hey uh, female is pregnant, she's turning up, uh, these otter watchers are incredible, uh, I don't know, it's like, you go to the toilet and they're watching you. So the moment the female was sluggish, they, one of them is a mom, so she said, I, I can recognize a pregnant woman, I used to waddle like that. So uh, they alerted us and said, uh, Sungai Bulo, uh, sorry, Singapore Botanic Garden, the mum is raising, rearing young. So we're like, oh, so excited. And then uh, eventually, when the young were born, they moved around Botanic Gardens, right? But then uh, Botanic Gardens is a nursery site. So it's like Bishan Amonkyo Park. You want to raise your pups, okay, it's great as a nursery site, but when you want to eat real solid food, uh, that place is exhausted already, you're going to move. So Bishan Amonkyo, what happens? They'll move down Kalang River towards Marina Bay. Uh, Singapore Botanic Gardens, they can move down river, and go to uh, Singapore River near uh, the old Zook, right? Uh, Jack Kim, right? Zion Road. Uh, but these guys went down there, oh, 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 occupied. So fight, 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 and then they backed off. So they, they've kept appearing around the central watershed, uh, Kandang Kerbal Hospital. Um, <coughs> sorry, it's not Kandang Kerbal Hospital. Uh, it's Kandang Kerbal Women's and Children Hospital now, right? Um, and then they turned out in Tantok Singh and they turned out in Little India. Uh, then they turned out in Istana, you know. So uh, my friends at Istana said, like, oh no, are they going to eat all the fish in Swan Lake? I said, your Swan Lake is too small. If it was a big, 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 big pond, a lake, then maybe they could stay there, but cannot. Huh? So they are, they, are nomad, they are nomads. They are lost. They are wandering, right? Uh, looking for a place to stay where... It's not occupied and they are in a very difficult situation. So what we are seeing is the validation of the carrying capacity. Central watershed, you've got Singapore River, Kalang River, Marina Bay. Okay, where's the fourth family going to live? Okay, they anchor themselves at Botanic Gardens and then come out and then look for a possible place. So they came out, they found a condo. Wow, got koi. Uh. Then one time they whacked the koi, right? There's no more food for tomorrow, you know. Uh, koi are uh, unfair, are really in an unfair situation because a koi pond right, or koi water feature, is trying to make the koi obvious. What does that mean? The koi got no place to hide. If koi go and hide, then the owner after spending $70,000 is like, where's my koi? I can't see my koi. So the koi is always in your face. So you show a koi in the otter's face, then they're like, eat lah. But because they're so easy to catch, it actually does the otter a disservice because they've eaten all of it, then what's for breakfast tomorrow? It's gone. So that's why they never stay at these places. They leave. Anyway, I must say uh, that condo fix all the gets very, very fast. They're very responsive. And Parks, when I talk to them, they're quite smart people. Uh, so they did a good job. But the authors will wonder, keep on wondering. Uh. Oh, the COVID effect uh, is that now when they un wander in an urban space, uh, less traffic, less people, so they can hang around and sit in the urban Little India when they sat down there. If you're familiar with Little India and used to the crowds that are there, then that's uh, mind-blowing. Like, what on earth is happening? So we should... Uh, pay respect to the crowds that are normally in Little India, which were not there, and so the author could just relax. Fair enough. Um, and we got a couple of, I think we'll do one last question, because this one last question has been asked a few times. The hybridization of the two author species. So there was a study done a while ago, right? And then um, it was found that the population here were hybrids. So are there any further studies done? Or is this something that's still ongoing? Like, do you think hybridization will occur in the future if we get more small plots in? Okay, normally they coexist and they don't hybridize. So, uh, was there an unnatural situation where they're living together? Uh, can it happen? It's happened in uh, Indonesian zoos before. Uh, what does it mean for us? Uh, this is maternal DNA la, sitting within the smooth quarter otter. So, uh, I think that we are contending with extreme habitat loss in Asia. Uh, so that's a bigger problem to solve. Uh, okay. Are there geneticists working on the hybridization issue? Yes, there is. Uh, but there are a lot of issues uh, because now genetic material you want to send across, uh, people are all possessive, like the Malaysians will be, why do I want to share with you? I want to do the study myself. 
then the Italian is sitting in the lab and I'm not going to let you do it because uh, I think your lab isn't as good as mine. So I want reliable record. So, and then there's a Japanese scientist working in Malaysia who said, we got to do something because your Singapore author is going to pollute the Malaysian population. I said, we didn't have Singapore uh, authors. These are all Malaysian authors. So mm -hmm. what you need to do is do a genetic test of the authors all over Pen Malaysia, figure it out. But uh, realistically, uh, hybridized or not, if we can still see them around 30 years time in the rest of Southeast Asia, it's due to the incredible effort that conservationists around the world are doing. So I'm not so concerned about the hybridization uh, uh, issue. Okay. Right, uh, Marcus, you got any questions? Okay, I'll, I'll wrap up the Q&A. So there was one last question um, in the Q&A, which I, I'm so interested. So regarding the Little India authors that, that was um, on the papers, right? Um, there was a question which asked, uh, which of the four families was, was this? And you said there were four families and this is a tragic story. So which, which of these four families were it's they? It's not a tragic story. La. I'm sorry I said that. La. It's just, a, that, that one's being anthropomorphic, like, you know, the, the wandering Lonely Hearts Club or something. This is just a normal story. This happens all the time. It happens with kingfishers. It happens with long tail macaque. It happens with civets, right? It happens with parrots. It's just that we don't see it. Here, it gets played out in front of our eyes. There are people who explain what's going on. And so, yeah. So, uh, sorry, Marcus, what was the question? Uh, so the question was, uh, which of this four, the, the Bishan and the Marina are the very famous ones. Uh, were this part of this family? Or were they a oh, okay. So the nomenclature is very confusing. Lah. It's from where the first litter was born. So now the, the group that you see wandering around is the Zook otters. So that means the first litter was born at Singapore River. But of course, you know, I told you they went to Singapore Botanic Gardens to raise their second litter. And then when they wandered out the Singapore River, it was occupied by the Singapore Botanic Gardens family which now raise a litter at, at Zook. So when Anusha did a thesis, I say, for goodness sake, call them family one, family two, family three, family four, right? Uh, what is the family at Bishan, Amokil? So the author watchers say, oh, that's Marina family. So Bishan is somewhere in Marina Bay, uh, and they came up Singapore River to fight with the Botanic Gardens authors who had previously fended off the Zook family. Oh, okay. This one's like so opera, like, you know, Korean drama. Or something. <laughs> uh, you you got to follow <laughs> it every families. weekend. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's the only reason we are sure is because author watchers follow very often. Uh, right? So now, during, uh, so now they are being tested because they cannot walk around, right? Right? Now, now, now they cannot walk around. So when reports come in, they are using their uh, up to circuit breaker. Where were the authors? What was the family composition? So where should it be? Right? Uh, then when people say, oh, like one author was limping. So you know, Zook got one that's limping. Uh, it's requiring all the, uh, um, all the powers of the force to keep track of records that are coming in. So every day they talk about this, you know. Uh, so because of that, we are able to track the families because most of the smooth quarter authors look alike. It's a brown furry thing. Uh. So, I mean, look, look behind me. This is Mei Huang's photo. 18 of the Bishan family sleeping, how are you going to differentiate them? So it's on the daily tracking, the family composition um, that we are able to follow who went where and did what. That's so awesome. Yeah, uh, working on leopard cats, you can tell, that's hard to tell them apart, but for authors, it's, I can imagine it's much, much harder, and much more challenging. So, um, so we've come to the end of the talk for Siva. I'm going to unmute everyone and maybe we could all thank him for giving such an engaging and uh, insightful talk for authors in Singapore. So I knew don't, all. But don't leave yet right, because we are having thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Shiva. Thank you. Thank you, Shiva. Everyone, thanks for coming. Thanks, Shiva. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Shiva. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, but don't leave yet because we still have the quiz going on, uh, which is we are going to start in a one in one hot minute. So you guys can just go along, grab your pens and papers, and prepare yourselves while I prepare the quiz. Okay. So that was such an uh, amazing talk. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so, so we are, we will be reading, starting the quiz shortly. Uh, okay. There will be. Uh, do, do you want me to share the screen or shall I? 
Uh, you can share the screen and then we can show the instructions so people can update okay. the form. So I see the form is being updated as we speak. That is great. Excellent. And okay, more so, than, yeah, go on, Kanan. Yeah, so this is your details and uh, you guys can start doing it. It is similar to last week's quiz if you were here. However, there's one small change. I'm not going to make you guys submit your answers after every round. We are going to submit the answers once at the end of the whole thing. So my phone doesn't explode emails and you guys don't have to like, keep rushing. Right. I've also numbered the questions. Um, there's only one uh, submission. So I've listened to what you guys wanted and I've made it a lot easier. So I hope you all have fun. Mm -hmm. For those who are joining us uh, for the first time, uh, this trivia, I'll go through the, the rounds again. So we're going to play four rounds. Um, and this week's team is, is CPF plus a bonus round. So you'll find out what CPF is in a bit. Uh, so if you haven't updated your team name and your beneficiary, so on the Google Sheet, please go ahead and do so. So even if you have not uh, contributed to the trivia pod, uh, you can still add a, a, your beneficiary. So whoever wins gets to choose uh, which local environmental animal uh, nonprofit gets the trivia pod. So yep. on a code, uh, we only require you to up, uh, send us your answers at the end. We'll check for the winners especially. Uh, and no looking up of answers, no Googling, no opening of books. If you're playing as a team, you can ask, uh, work with among your team. Right, so that is all I have. And so Kanan, please take over. Yeah. Yes, you can work as a team. So if you've got friends on here, you guys can work together and you can come up with a team name. You know, more brains better than one. So you all can do it. Okay. So uh, without further ado, it's 4.42. Let's get this thing rolling. And uh, yes, as Marcus said, this is where you can, you can put your trivia port contribution. You can pay now to 88931891 or you can PayPal me. And for the comments, just put your name slash SG stem. All right, and let's go. So for the C in CPF stands for creatures. Uh, yes, there will be bisons of creatures in quizzes because both Marcus and I study mammals, so creatures. So oh, first question, a flutter is the collective noun for which creature? A flutter is the collective noun for which creature? So you have stuff like a waddle of penguins, a parliament of owls, a shrewdness of apes, a bloat of hippos. So a flutter of? Okay, and uh, I'm going to go to the next question. What color is a polar bear's skin? What is the color of a polar bear's skin? Oh, if you guys need me to go through any questions again, right? Just put a message, something, uh, message me privately or, or in the chat and I will sort it out. Right, question two, what is the color of a polar bear's skin? And we will move on. A wordy question. The Mozambique tilapia was introduced to Singapore as a food fish. Who were the people who introduced this fish to Singapore? The Mozambique tilapia was introduced to Singapore as a food fish. Who were the people who introduced this fish to Singapore? So when I want this, I want this as a uh, nationality of the people. Okay, and next. In which country can you find lions, tigers, leopards, and snow leopards living in the wild? In which country can you find lions, tigers, leopards, and snow leopards living in the wild? And for the last question in the creatures round, which is heavier? A hundred mala ducks or one miniature horse? Which is heavier, a hundred ducks or one miniature horse? By the way, the ducks uh, in the pictures, they're both the same species. They have uh, sexual dimorphism. So the male is the one with the, bit, the big bright green head, while the female is a brown speckled one. And okay. for the miniature horse, it's um, uh, about the size of a pony or slightly smaller. You can find them in the zoos. Uh, some people ride them. Yeah, and I, th and I think the smallest uh, miniature horse on record is Plumberlina. And uh, you can look her up, she's tiny. You know, she's like the size of like a medium-sized dog. Okay, uh, so moving on to P. And P in CPF stands for phobias. So this question is all going to, going to be related about phobias. I have featured one of my, well, I wouldn't say it's, it's a, like a full phobia, but I've got a fear of something, so I featured that here as well. Let's see whether you all can figure out what it is. And for question one in phobias, according to a YouGov survey, YouGov survey, what do Singaporeans fear the most? 
according to a YouGov survey, what do Singaporeans fear the most? A, drowning, B, cockroaches, C, ghosts, and D, public speaking. According to a YouGov survey, what do Singaporeans fear the most? A, drowning, B, cockroaches, C, ghosts, D, public speaking. Obviously and not the last them. one for you. Sorry? <laughs> Obviously not the last one for you, Kanan. Oh, you have no idea, man. <laughs> and also all these fe uh, fears were actually featured on the list. I think they are, they are about 16 or 17 fears. So I picked four of them. But one of them is the most. Question two. If you suffer from aerophobia, what are you afraid of? If you suffer from aerophobia, what are you afraid of? Someone has just commented the Singaporeans fear exam results. You are not wrong. We do fear our exam results. You know what we fear more than exam results? Bringing it back home. Yeah, I, I hated bringing my results home. Oh my God. Right, question three. I'm going to take a breath here. Yeah? Triskaidekophobia. Triskaidekophobia is a fear of A, Triscuits, B, the number 13 and everything related to it, C, Triskels and D, the number 30 and everything related to it. Triskaidekophobia is a fear of Triscuits, the number 13 and everything related to it, Triscals or the number 30 and everything related to it. And for those who are wondering what a Triscal is, you see the um, spirally thing at the bottom, that's a Triscal. So it's like a spiral thing with three outward growths. So your three legs uh, cooling water, yeah, that's considered a Triscal or like a modification of it. All right, and next one. What is the name of the 1990 comedy horror film named after the fear of spiders that features a newly discovered spider brought to the USA, which began killing people? What is the name of the 1990 comedy horror film named after the fear of spiders that features a newly discovered spider brought to the USA, which began killing people? I like how, like, while people are doing the quiz, they're still active on the chat as well. That's excellent. As long as you guys don't start sharing answers on the quiz, I'm perfectly, uh, on the chat, I'm perfectly fine, you know, having y'all talk, talking over there. Let's go to the last question in phobias. From which language does the root word of phobia originate? From which language does the root word of phobia originate? A, Arabic, B, Greek, C, Hebrew, D, Latin. From which language does the root word of phobia originate is the last question. So uh, obviously I've done an error here. Question four, this is supposed to be question five, not question three. So yes, so this is question five, right? So we will go on to the next one. Uh, and the last one in CPF is foods. Right, so let's get on with the food questions. I hope everyone's eaten, I'm quite hungry. So, oh yes, very question. Which of the following is considered to be Singapore's national dish? Which of the following is considered to be Singapore's national dish? A, Hokkien Mee, B, Hainanese Chicken Rice, C, Katong Laksa, and D, Rojak. Which of the following is considered to be Singapore's national dish? Thing is, I like all of them, so you know, do not look to me for answers. I'll gladly take all four of them. And more, like you know, everything in the picture. I had a lot of fun doing preparing this part of the quiz because I was just like, oh, you know what? Once circuit breaker ends, I'm going to get some of these, some of that. So, yeah. Second question, which is the most consumed meat in the world? Which is the most consumed meat in the world? Okay. And... Uh, we will go on to question number three. Question number three. What animal's flesh is fermented to make Iceland's national dish hakarl? I did not learn how to pronounce it though. I should have. Hakarl? Yeah. Which animal's flesh is fermented to make Iceland's national dish? 
you know, I'm just going to say over here, right? Fermented is a soft word. From what I'm reading and what I've read about this dish, right? The flesh is almost left to rot. And apparently you can smell it from miles away. And it's considered to be like one of the most potent dishes around. So which animal's flesh has been, is fermented to make Iceland's national dish? Dish. All right. And here we go to question four. Oh, getting ahead of myself there. The, uh, the sap of this plant is used to produce a sweetener for al and for alcoholic drinks. Its leaves are used for wrapping Southeast Asian food and its seeds are, are an ingredient in Southeast Asian desserts. What plant is this? The sap of this plant is used to produce a sweetener for alcoholic drinks, its leaves for wrapping Southeast Asian food and its seeds are an ingredient in Southeast Asian desserts. What plant is this? So since SG STEM is basically, is, is largely Singapore based, we try to keep the questions kind of like home, homebound kind of thing. So we have questions based on Singapore and Southeast Asia. But since we also have people joining us from like, you know, there are people joining us from like around the world, we keep some of the generic uh, international questions as well. Okay, uh, and question five. Name the cultivar of apple or breed, if you're going to look for a different word, name the cultivar or breed of apple that is the national apple of Canada and it has inspired a line of products from Apple Inc. Name the cultivar of apple that is the national apple of Canada and has inspired a line of products from Apple Inc. These last two questions are for, from the botanists who feedback that there aren't enough, um, too many animal questions. Yeah, this is what you get when you get like two you know, animal guys writing this, but we will try to have a, you know, we could have a botany around the next, the next time we do a quiz and we can try to bring in more animals, which are not vertebrates because there is a very strong vertebrate mammal bias going on here. So I will admit it. Right. So this is the last question. Uh, so what's going to happen is you guys are going to, Marcus, what's going to happen? Because I think oh, you so explained this, this part better than me. Go on. So we're going to go through the answers. You're going to mark your answers. And once you've totaled up your answers for each round, uh, we're going to update it on the Google Sheet. And then um, I would go through how we would proceed from there for the bonus round. So we can go ahead and go through the answers uh, right now. Okay, cool. Uh, so there'll be a bonus round as well. So yeah, because last week there was a lot of like mix up and stuff. So we are going to do it step by step. It'll be slow, but it will be so much easier for you guys. Because I remember last week, you guys were just sending answers now. Uh, and you do not send any answers now. Did they send the answers to Marcus? No, uh, answers we sent in until after, after the whole quiz, at the end of the whole quiz. Yeah, so we are trusting you guys, right? So, corner code, right? Stick to it and we will get your answers from you shortly and let's carry on. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, this was what okay. we decided to do, but we are not doing this now. So just take a break and we will carry on with the answers, okay? So, a flutter is a collective noun for butterflies. So when you see a group of butterflies, you can say a flutter of butterflies, which if you say five times as fast, will definitely be a tongue twister. A flutter of butterflies, a flutter of butterflies, a flutter of butterflies. Yeah. You know what I mean, yeah? Uh, question two, what is the color of a polar bear skin? Black. Under all that light colored fur, polar bear skin is black. And fun fact, their fur is not white. Uh, polar bear fur is pretty much transparent and when you stack them all together, they reflect light and they look white. But the skin color is black. The Mozambique tilapia was introduced to Singapore as a food fish by the Japanese. This happened uh, during World War II. So the Japanese brought the fish actually not from Mozambique, they actually brought it from Java to bring it here as a food fish, which is why locally some people call this a Japanese fish and some people call this the Javan fish. So the Japanese brought the Mozambique tilapia to Singapore as a food fish. Question four, you can find all these big cats in India. You have the Asiatic lion, you have the Bengal tiger, you have the Indian leopard, and right up in, uh, around the Himalayan range, which runs in India, you can find the snow leopard. So India has four out of the five big cat species. The last big cat species is, of course, in the new world, the jaguar. And which is heavier? 100 ducks are a mini horse, 100 ducks are heavier. 
a duck weighs about, give or take a kilogram. A mini horse weighs about 30 to 40 kilograms. So 100 ducks will easily overpower a mini horse. Okay, and now let's go on to phobia answers. Yes, Singaporeans fear drowning. I think it's a fear that comes from living on an island and where every picnic is on a beach. So I think we will uh, accept drowning. And this is the uh, order in which the fears were ranked. So they fear drowning the most. And then you had cockroaches, ghosts, and public speaking was towards the end. And if you suffer from aerophobia, you are afraid of flying. While I do not have like a strong aerophobia, I absolutely hate flying. Like I can't deal with it, which is surprising seeing that I went to uni in the UK and I have to fly there like twice a year. And I'm like, uh, that's not hot. Shreskadekophobia, if you have watched Friends, you will know that it is the fear of the number 13 and everything related to it. And it's not the fear of Triscuits, as Ross points out. Um, what is the name of the 1990 comedy named after a fear of spiders? It's arachnophobia. Phobia, obviously, fear and arachno for arachnids, spiders. I hear they're doing a remake of this film uh, by James Wan. So. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> and question five, not question three. Uh, phobia has its roots in Greek. So I learned this recently um, that phobia, words that start with PH, uh, have their roots in Greek. So there, I learned something, you learned something. And lastly, food. Yes. Food questions. The Hainanese chicken rice is considered to be Singapore's national dish. And it is also my favorite on this list, might I add. I'm just doing a lot of promo for myself. Like, I hate flying. I love chicken rice. So, you know. And the most consumed meat in the world is pork. For a while, for the, for the longest time, it was chicken. And then pork took over. And pork is the most consumed meat in the world. And um, the animal whose flesh is fermented or rotted to make Iceland's national dish is the shark. Specifically, they go for Greenland sharks, which is featured over here, or they go for any other kind of sleeper shark. <coughs> Fun fact about the Greenland shark, they can live to over like to be over like 300 years old. <coughs> and uh, let's go for question four, which is this amazing plant? It is the Nipa palm. Is it Nipa or Nipa, Marcus? I say uh, Nipa. Nipa. Nipa? Okay. So that is the plan. And also fun fact, right? That is the plan right there in the images. So I kind of put the answers there. If anyone could identify the plan by your leaf by the by your leaves and you got it, good to you. Good for you. So uh Nipper. Hmm, well, people are asking whether um, yeah. palm counts. Let's give them half a point. Yeah, you know what? If you put palm, we'll give you half a point. Go for it, because palm is quite versatile as well in its use. Or Gwyn is saying that it goes nipa. Okay. Uh, learn something again. And the apple question is Macintosh. Macintosh is the cultivar or breed of apple that is the national apple of Canada and it's inspired a line of products from Apple Inc. Again, I put the picture uh, as the answer and that is a Macintosh apple. Although they come in a lot of weird colors, like I've seen some which is like really deep red, but most of them were like this yellowy reddish color. So I went with this. Uh, I think if you spell Macintosh with an A, we will accept it as well. And yes, uh, Teresa is right. Uh, Nipa palm gives us the Atapchi seed, which we have in a lot of uh, desserts. Okay, so uh, next is the bonus round. Marcus, take it away. Okay, so for this round, uh, tally up the scores first. So see how much is your total score. So this is the amount of points you can use to wager uh, for the bonus round. So how does it work? So let's say if you're, you've got full marks for all three rounds, so you have 15 points. You can wager from um, one point to 15 points in the bonus round. And if you get the bonus question correct, you get 15 plus 15 if you wager 15. If you got one, if you wagered one point, uh, you only get 16 points if you get, uh, in total if you get the bonus question correct. But if you got it wrong, you subtract the amount you wager from the points you have. So if you wagered 15 points, you got it wrong, uh, you get zero points, right? So fill up your points and your wager amount uh, in, the, in the trivia. Or you can fill it, write it down on the paper first. Yep. 
then um, we're going to review the answer for the bonus round. So I'll, we'll give everyone maybe a minute and a half to tally yeah. up your score. I think, and... I, yeah, I, think, I think we'll show them the bonus question as well. No, 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 no. Oh, you don't want to show the question. Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> You're not supposed to know the question unless you know it's oh, correct or wrong, right? That is true. Yeah, so yeah. we let everyone uh, total their scores and then decide uh, whether you're feeling lucky or not, how, how much you want to wager your points. And also, I just want to say, right, only wager what points you have. Do not come and wager 100 points and say that you, de you deserve to win because you put 100 points in. Let's, let's not drop names, lah, Marcus. Let's not drop names. <laughs> Okay, so once you guys are done, uh, Marcus, check out the list. Let me know when I can continue. Um, let's take a look at it. Ooh, some very high scores. Okay, I think almost everyone has it down. And it seems that more than 50% of the people here are playing for Acres. That's nice. Okay. All right, so... All right, I think we can go on now. Yes. All right, you guys ready for your bonus round? So the bonus round is always based on uh, our guest speakers' talks and answers. So let's see how much you listened to uh, Siva's talk on otters. Bonus round, which family group does the otters at Little India belong to? Which family group are these otters from? So write it down. Siva mentioned it a couple of times and Marcus highlighted it as the last question. So which family group are the Little India otters from? And we'll carry on shortly. Let me know when it's good, Marcus. Because uh, I'm asking because Marcus is watching the list as it fills up while I'm watching my screen of questions. So yeah, it's already filled up. So I think as as everyone writes your answer down in your paper or types it out, I think we should be ready. Okay. No, 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 no. Family, as in which family? Um, from where? Yeah. So uh, you you got the Marina family, uh, this and that, yeah. So yeah. not uh, not the scientific family. Yeah, no, not the Muslim family. Yeah, it's the the local uh, family. Any yeah. other questions so how, how, this? Yeah. So if you guys have written on Muslim day or Muslim, just change it to the local family. Okay, so I think we can re review the answer for that. Okay, so the family group of otters belong to... Oh, okay, I've, I've got a separate slide here as well. Zook, the otter families at Little India, they belong to the Zook family. Yeah, shout out to the Otter Watch Facebook page as well. So the answer is right there on the first post on the Otter Watch Facebook page. So if you go there and uh, search and follow then can find out more about authors in Singapore. All right, so uh, what we hope everyone would do now is, um, next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, thanks for playing. Please submit um, the photos and text of your answer to the email, uh, sgstem.talktrivia at gmail.com. We're gonna go through the winner's answer as well as uh, sample some of the other answers. And also, please update your score and your wager for the bonus round. Yeah, I think everyone has learned to uh, some strategy in playing this. And so far, anonymous Malayan is the highest score. <laughs> go big or go home, but we are already home. Yeah, we are already home. Uh, yes, uh, Sinway, you can send the pot money now. Uh, I think if you scroll up the chat, Marcus has put the uh, donation link somewhere there. So you can send the money in there. All right, I'm receiving all of the answers now. So we, we will check it and we'll get through to you guys. Yep, that's the one. Is there any, any uh, winners yet, Marcus? It seems to anonymous Malayan monitor, which I think it's Ivan. It says yay. We'll see here. Seems to be that. Oh, congrats. Congrats, Anonymous, anonymous Malayan Monitor. Uh, and so the money unofficially goes to Acres for now. 
Super. Yeah, as usual, as usual, we will look through all the answers and we will put up a post uh, in an email saying who won. Yep. So uh, we also have a website uh, where we posted last week's winner as well as a receipt for the donation. So we'll flash up the website after this. And I think Ivan was a uh, first runner up in the last one. Now he has emerged victorious. So congrats. So uh, thanks for playing. We will we'll talk about what's happening next week. So we'll go on to our yep. next slide. Oh, yep. Here we go. As usual, we want to plug in for next week's speaker, and we have uh, Nalini from NUS. And Nalini is going to be talking to us about using insects to combat food waste. So currently, her, I'm just going to give a little, you know, so they're using like black soldier flies, and they're trying to like convert them, uh, use them to convert food waste into fertilizer and stuff like that. So minimize wastage. So she's going to be talking to us about that next week. So if insects are your thing and low food wastage or zero food wastage is your thing, you want to sign up for this talk. As usual, we'll be dropping a lot of uh, links and registration stuff over the week on all of our social media pages. So you guys can uh, hit up the link there and join us. I think the link is active now, right, Marcus? Yes, the link is very active and we'll send out a follow-up email for you guys and uh, with the link as well. Yep, so the link at the bottom is active. So, yeah, that is us for now. And uh, I think we are done for today. Uh, oh, you if need to take a photo, right? Yeah, I was going to say that. Thanks for reminding me, Siva. If people can switch on your cameras, right, and uh, get in for the good old pictures, because we will take Weefies now, and then, uh, yeah, we'll post it up. So everyone just... Get, get your cameras on and join us. It's Anbu, is your face. chicken here today? Anbu was here just now. Oh, she's... Yeah, she was. Yeah, but did she bring a chicken along? Yeah, the chicken no, was I standing didn't. on her side, not ah, the okay. camera like last week. So. <laughs> okay, I'm going to count down. Three, two, one. Say cheese. And I'm going to go to the next page, next gallery page. Someone has an author soft toy, Joe. Three, two, one. Say cheese. All right, super. Great photo, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Uh, I hope you guys had fun. And um, same thing, we will see you next week. Same time, same place, your homes. Uh, so that will be at 4 p.m. So go sign up for the uh, talk by Nalini. Right. Until then, remember, stay safe, stay home, and remember to stay connected with science. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care.